Hi, I'm Brett Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. It's very rare we get the opportunity to report on a win in the struggle for fairness regarding issues affecting the health and well-being of tens of thousands of Canadians. But today, we can. Over the past year, RegWatch has covered Ontario's auto insurance system from the perspective of health service providers. There are over 20,000 physiotherapists, chiropractors, and massage therapists who provide rehabilitation treatment to victims of auto accidents. But this critical care is in jeopardy as health service providers struggle with a decade-long freeze in the fees they charge auto insurance companies and the layers of red tape hindering delivery of quality patient care. But relief may be in sight following commitments made by the Doug Ford Progressive Conservative government in Ontario's 2024 budget, just released in late March. Joining us today to talk through the changes and their impact on patient care is registered physiotherapist Anthony Grande, owner of Focused Physiotherapy, a chain of clinics located in the Toronto area, and Dr. Scott Wilson, a doctor of chiropractic and founder and chairman of Physiomed, one of Canada's largest chains of healthcare clinics. Gentlemen, it's great to have you both back on the show. Nice to speak to you again, Brent. Thank you, Brent. Pleasure to be here. So, Anthony, let's start with you. We'll dive into the details in a moment, but top line, how happy are you with the Doug Ford government and with what's been promised in Ontario's 2024 budget? Well, uh, top line, I, I can honestly say I'm incredibly happy. I, 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 I think you, you'll remember that when we, when, we, when we spoke a while ago, um, we were really we were really in a tough place and and and, and we still are uh, the changes haven't been implemented but clinics in ontario were working so hard with so little for so long and they were struggling and and these changes are so important so that we could deliver the patient care uh, the sustainable patient care that we really want to do i think this government did a great job with any other government it, historically nothing has happened this government got the job done. And Scott, what do you think of these proposed changes by Doug Ford's government? I think, I mean, as Anthony said, they're fantastic for the, I mean, patients first, and of course the health service providers. It it allows for a, a reset um, for a system that has been uh, in purgatory and perhaps broken for the past, you know, 10, 12 years that someone is actually casting a proactive eye on it. And, you know, with the the two major areas, which we'll delve into, you know, it's it's not only going to be great for, you know, the, the, the patient delivery, transparency, and understanding of what um, a patient should receive after an auto accident, but it will definitely reduce a lot of the burden and resources that were needed prior to these proposed changes. Let's remind our viewers a bit about what the troubles are with the system as it was before we discuss the potential changes in detail. Anthony, when you were first on the show last April, this is what you had to say about the top three changes you were looking for. Anthony, based on what you've been telling us, these are the three things you are immediately asking for. One, an overall increase in the rate schedule with some process for ongoing adjustments. Two, removal of the requirement to partially bill workplace insurance first before the auto insurer. And three, remove the redundant regulator from the process or at least all the red tape. The most important thing would be to decrease the red tape that we have to deal with, with this invoicing system and the red tape with the redundant regulation and the, 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 the fees. With each patient that comes in, the busier you are, the more red tape you have to deal with, the more hurdles you have to jump through, the more difficult it is. You know, it, it, the reduction in red tape removal of redundancies is, is 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 almost it's almost more important than than a fee increase believe me a fee increase is important but to remove the red tape and the hurdles to invoice and it, it, it's just 
it's astounding what we have to do. Dr. Wilson, I think the Ontario provincial government's priorities are becoming clear here. FISRA is a new regulatory agency. It became active in 2019 when it took over for the now defunct Financial Services Commission of Ontario. The provincial government updated the Insurance Act, amending several schedules directly governing your industry. In 2019, they amended service providers, public registry, principal representatives, business systems and practices, and of course, licensing. And that's where they get their money from you. But the one schedule they left untouched is service providers listed expenses. And this is the all important schedule that governs your rates that you can charge it has not been updated since 2014. What are your thoughts? So, I mean, this is exactly where you get back to why is that not being done? And who is FISRA truly representing? At the end of the day, as I had mentioned, you know, we all want what's best for Ontarians. We want what's best for obviously the care they're going to receive. But we also need to be in a marketplace that makes sense for clinics to be able to provide that in a seamless, you know, fair manner that is obviously in line with inflation. 2014 is nine years ago. And, and clearly, if they've done all of these other updates and left this one alone, and you have 15 new people who come from the insurance and insurance background, where is the advocate at FISRA for clinics, for practitioners? Okay, that's a small slice of our coverage. The problems facing your industry that impact auto accident victims are complex. You have FISRA, the financial regulator that for some reason regulates health service providers. You have the provincial government that legislates and you have auto insurance companies that I assume most Ontarians consider rapacious. Who wants to go first? Well, I'll go first. Um, you know, I have to say, you know, the, his, the last 25 years, and especially since 2010, there's been a lot of pain for us. Uh, it's been difficult to treat, to treat the patients that we want to get better. It's been difficult to operate sustainably. The pain's been sharp. The pain's been long. It's, it's, it's been ongoing. You know, as, uh, as health service providers, you know, we always... You know, I, I hate to use the term health service provider. We're actually we're healthcare professionals, and as healthcare professionals, you know, the pain has been long and hard. Uh, we put our patients first, and 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 at the end of the day, you know, we put our needs second. Our goal is to make sure that our patients recover and return to normal life. With all the red tape, with all the invoicing that would take us seven months to send out our first invoice, with unsustainable fees. It hurts every healthcare professional when they don't have enough in the financial tank that's provided in the the the, guide, the the treatment guidelines to actually get a person back to work and back to being productive. You know the red tape, the poor remuneration, the 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 the, the incredibly redundant overregulation with people who don't understand the importance of what we're trying to do. That's really how it felt like. Scott, let me ask you, are auto accident victims in Ontario receiving the care they need? Unfortunately, they they get out of the gate in a good position because of the minor injury guideline allows everyone to get some care. What often happens in these, these are traumas, right? These are, you know, accidents on impact. Um, I, I don't know the exact stat, but I, I would take a guess that it's probably, you know, four of five people are not at fault, I either a passenger, a pedestrian, or it's two drivers where they can't determine that fault. So you're looking at a lot of true accidents. And when you're a passenger in a car and you get into an accident, you get, you know, your preliminary care under the minor injury guideline, there are limits to that. And it's getting tougher and tougher and tougher to come against the insurers to be able to provide care within that framework, especially when the fees haven't been reviewed in over 10 years. So 
this is where, you know, when you think about it, I, I can't imagine there's anybody in today's world um, listening to this that doesn't know that we're going through inflation, that hasn't seen that post COVID, everything is more expensive, everything at the gas pumps, it doesn't matter where, food. That has not happened in our industry. Yet, it's on us, as Anthony said, it's up to us to give the care to, to the recovery of people, yet we're doing it on a smaller budget. As I mean, I don't want to be redundant to the red tape world, but we're doing it with high administrative costs. So to, you know, this is truly an exciting, exciting moment and win to think and understand that the government is now proposing to look at this, to, you know, eliminate a first party payer with extended health care and to revisit and look at these, you know, antiquated financial models for care, because, you know, to get back to your question, we can't get past these minor injury guidelines appropriately with proper care if we know that we're not getting remunerated appropriately. And unfortunately, we're under the guise of that legislature to dictate, you know, how much we can charge and what we can do in terms of value for our patients. It gets difficult. So what do you end up doing? As Anthony has mentioned, you know, you, you start you start having a hard time running your business to do what's best, which is make the patient or get the patient back to pre-accident state activities of daily living. Now, we were hoping that the fall economic statement would deliver some relief, but it was just crickets. However, right there on page 73 of the 2024 Ontario Provincial Budget, under the heading Reviewing Health Service Provider Guidelines and Frameworks, the government is committed to ensuring that those injured in auto accidents continue to receive the care they need and that health service providers are compensated appropriately for their services. Gentlemen, after 10 long years, a possible increase in the rate schedule, that must be music to your ears. Brent, yes, it is. And it's been 10 long years since we've had an hourly rate increase, but it's been 14 years since anybody's looked at the minor injury guidelines, which are the lowest in Canada. And what's really important here, what's really important here is we have finally the opportunity, the, the, the possibility to get more people better, to get more people back to work. People don't know that the devil's always in the details. And the minor injury guideline currently as it stands, it's so difficult to get people better. It remunerates healthcare professionals $200, around $200 for a month of treatment for a person who's been injured in a car accident. Now, $200 for an entire month of care for healthcare professionals to try to turn that into something that actually has positive outcomes, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. Healthcare professionals have been, you know, burning the midnight oil, trying to, when rents have gone up, Rents are not at 2010 levels when everything has gone up since then. And we have $200 for a month of care. That means we really have to see a lot of people, which means that each individual patient can only get so much. It is such an unfortunate circumstance for people who want to get back to work, who don't want to fall on social assistance, who really want to return to a productive life. No, it's, it's not just about healthcare professionals. You know, but it, it took healthcare professionals to who, who don't want to ask for anything from they don't want to ask anything from anybody, but we've had to ask on behalf of our patients so that we can actually have a chance at getting them better. We are part of the community. We want our people to go back to work. We want our moms to take care of their kids. It's for them. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, you wouldn't think that you could get into a car accident in Ontario and find yourself unable to get care. The minor injury guideline in, in Ontario is the lowest in Canada. I mean, the whole concept of you know no fault insurance was exactly that. Your insurance company will take care of you regardless if you're at fault or not. And ever since that was put in place, I believe in like 1990 or 91, um, 
the Bob Ray government, uh, it's just been chipped away, chipped away, chipped away at to where it it wasn't even a good uh, a good place for us in 2010 when it came on. But we've been operating in like in this framework for 14 years, and as I think I alluded to the last time that I was on on your show, that you know these were often reviewed with a new bill every five years to seven years. There has been a long hiatus here and no one has really taken the initiative at the government level to look at this. And on top, they brought in a regulator from the, from the Minister of Finance without getting into the details of the fact that you know regulated health professionals are regulated. They have their own colleges, they have their own oversight. But to get in the fact that that's what's, that's what's happened since 2010, and fees haven't gone up and the MIG has stayed the same. The, the, the MIG, the minor injury guideline has been the same. If you're in an accident, what ultimately happens, and people may not understand this, the moment your insurance company says, we don't think you deserve care beyond the minor injury guideline, you then have to make a decision of, am I going to pay out of pocket? Am I going to fight my insurer? But how do I do that? What do I do? Well, that's when you start getting into the litigious side and you go and you hire yourself a lawyer. Now it turns into a process. Now I need to have my own spokesperson. It gets, it becomes now an investment of an extreme amount of resources, time, money, taking time away from work. But I think what's also lost is the psychological and mental angst that goes in on this. If I'm still in pain and I'm under a guideline that only offers me a limited amount of care and my insurance company and and I want to draw a parallel quite just so people understand the difference in a car accident with our side which is the accident benefit side versus property property is your car if your car got hit and you take it to a body shop whether it's a preferred provider body shop that an insurance company has or the body shop that you choose you're going to look at that car when it comes back. And if it's not the way you want, you'll tell them, you know what? I need you to fix that a little bit more. You're not going to take your car in a, in a, in its state. That's not where it was before the accident. You just won't. And the body shop will appease that request. When it comes to your health, where you've got objective data, now you've got a subjective overlay of mental anguish. You've got into an accident. Let's add on to that that some third party insurer who is in most cases is not a regulated health provider, has not done any examinations, is making a determination that you don't require care outside of the minor injury guideline. Your only hope is to then go a litigious route. How many people understand that, want to do that, are inclined to do that? And now when they go down that road, they have to now put their hands into the world of the legal system and know that the lawyers who, you know, by and large are working hard as advocates for the plaintiffs who are the people that are injured to get the care they need. So this minor injury in no way is enough. And people don't understand that if the insurance company decides that's it, that's it. Now it's on you to figure out how you're going to go fight them. That's a whole other battle and it brings on a lot of angst. So I'm really encouraged that the Ford government is going to look at this, look at the benchmarks, look at the, 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 the tiers, perhaps even look at the entire framework of how this looks because they revamped this in 2010. They revamped it in 2003. They revamped it in 1996. I, I started in 94. So I watched it revise in 96, revise in 03, rise in 10. It's done nothing since 2010, so it's overdue. So it's clear then that these proposed changes by the Doug Ford government are welcome, but let's just point out that they're not a done deal. Let's go back to the budget. Quote, the government is requesting that the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, FISRA, review the professional services guideline and the attendant care hourly rate guideline and consider updating these guidelines based on their findings. The government will consider FISRA's findings in future reviews of the statutory accident benefit schedule. 
So gentlemen, is this rate increase a locked rock solid commitment or does it all hinge on the regulator, FISRA? Well, if I might uh, go first, thanks Scott. Um, I think what we have is a rock solid commitment from the government to make sure that FISRA actually does its job because it was FISRA's responsibility to set the rates, set the maximum rates, and that's the law. And I think in, in some minds, that responsibility has been abdicated. And I think it's fair to say that when the government is instructing its agency to do something, the expectation is there. Much like when a boss tells an employee to do something, they're not gonna tell them to do something impossible. I think the expectation is clear that health service provider rates on an hourly basis being stagnant since 2014 and the minor injury guideline since 2010, I would think that's a bit of a dereliction of duty. And I think the rock solid commitment is there from the Ford government to ensure. And I think they know what they, I think they have a really good expectation of what they want to see. And let's see what happens. I agree. I think it's, it's also, um, I think, probably very um, evident with, with FISRA. They know, they're, they know in this particular area or sector, they are under fire. They were brought in under the auspice of watching for fraud, aberrant billings, abuse. I, I get every FISRA bulletin. I don't see anything, anything that falls into the auto accident uh, area, you know, over years. So now they have an annual fee. There's a cost. I mean, Brent, there's a cost for a clinic to actually treat motor vehicle accident patients. We have to pay to treat people, to have the right to use their billing system. And it's based on volume. So it's a volume driven, the, the bigger your, your clinic is, the more you pay for this. And this is money to FISRA. So I have to believe that FISRA knows this sector is one that's being watched. It's one that we've talked about. So to Anthony's point, if you know, we want to use the analogy of the boss and the employee, if the provincial conservatives, uh, the, the progressive conservatives of Ontario are giving the instructions, the mandate is FISRA follows through. If FISRA doesn't follow through, then I think this is just another step towards, you know, uh, uh, an advocacy to why are they there? Who are they representing? Because remember, there's three people in this equation. The actual patient, the client, the claimant, the person who pays the, the premiums, the insurance company who receives the premiums and is protecting that claimant and then the health service providers and of course we could look at the property side too but we're talking about the statute accident and benefits schedule us under all of this we need protection too and when you go back to it visra has in general been very 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 pro insurance so now we're and we're not asking them to be pro health service provider or health care provider, what we're asking them is fairness and that they consider that we need to be brought up to a level that makes sense. And, you know, revisiting the MIG, it has to start there. Let me just ask, because one of the things that we really uh, honed in on last year, and I think RegWatch might have started getting to the heart of it towards our end of our coverage in 2023 was just who is or what organization are responsible for making these changes because it seemed that like really for most of all of our coverage, nobody had a really good answer on who's responsible for increasing the rates, who's responsible for changing the MIG and so forth. It, do Have we figured that out now that it, it is the regulator or is it the government? Well, Brent, the legislation, the statutory accident benefits state that is the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario. It is within their mandate to set the maximum fees for health services providers. So it is clearly their mandate. It is clearly their job and their duty to set those rates. 
Now, they don't have a timeline for it. They don't have to do it on a yearly basis, but clearly it's their duty. And when that period of time between, between rate changes is 14 years for the minor injury guidelines and 10 years for professional services guidelines, that's not doing your job. And I think, to be fair, they only took over in 2018, 2019. But still, we're 2024 right now. Healthcare providers have been subsidizing the care that they've been providing to people injured in car accidents. And that's not fair. And that makes it difficult. And the government has seen this and stated, hey, in this budget, we want you to take a look at what at, at the health service provider fees and get back to us. And for that, healthcare providers are eternally grateful to the Ford government and the Minister of Finance, Peter Bethlenfalvy, because it takes a lot to look at an issue and see, hold on a second, this is an unfairness that needs to be addressed. And we're really grateful for that because these are issues that, believe me, healthcare providers have been asking for this for 14 years. They didn't wake up one day and say, oh, I haven't been paid for four, year after year after year. Healthcare providers were talking to the regulator. It was fiscal. Now it's with, it's FISRA. And it's fallen on deaf ears. And thank goodness people started approaching the government directly. And the one thing about healthcare providers, they don't ask for help. They give help. So it's really hard for them to go to somebody and say, hey, can you help me out? But they did. But they didn't do it for themselves. They did it for their patients. Because many were just deciding to close up shop or leave the industry altogether, leave the province, but they want, they, they've been staying so that they can get their patients better. That, that's why we do things, because in, in, in many of our opinions, there's nothing more noble than helping somebody. The other big news out of the budget and something every RegWatch guest has mentioned during our coverage concerns the first payer rule in Ontario, which requires that a person's workplace extended health insurance must be billed and exhausted first before the auto insurer is billed. Now, this rule is outrageous, is it not? Absolutely. I, I mean, there's, there's no doubt the abundance of administration that goes into an, um, a system that is not integrated. We're in a world today where we can buy things off our phone, order tickets, transfer tickets, between the, all of these things are done seamlessly, yet the platform that is, you know, HKI used to, you know, put claims in for auto accidents is different. And it's not, you know, it's not nearly as efficient as it could be or should be, but we deal with it. But that doesn't connect to TELUS or to uh, Provider Connect or to Sun Life or to other third party payers where we have to then coordinate a different system, provide that, uh, you know, information, get that back to us. If there's a spouse, there's a coordination of benefit, there's all kinds of administration. But I want to touch on the, um, the, the patient. There are a lot of patients in our clinics. I mean, truly, when you run a clinic, that's a family clinic, you are going to have for every car accident case, you're going to have probably four, three, five, family practice cases. I mean, obviously they're, you know, the, the population, there's more people, you know, slipping and falling or having a sports injury or, you know, sitting in a chair and getting neck pain than there are getting in car accidents. Those people rely on their work benefits for chronic recurrent conditions, chronic, been there a long time, recurrent. It's not always sore, but it comes and goes. That is the predominant presentation of a patient in a physiotherapy chiropractic like setting. When you're relying on your work benefits to provide that sort of care throughout the year, when you have episodes to get you better and in the early part of your benefit year, which in most cases is January, you happen to be a passenger in a car, get into an accident, injure a part of your body that's never been injured before, though you've got a chronic problem in your knee or in your neck, and I'm being told that I have to use up all of my benefits 
for this injury that I incurred as a passenger in a car, it makes absolutely no clinical sense, business sense, uh, administration sense, anything. It, they're just different buckets, notwithstanding the fact that they're not synchronous. They're not synchronous in their administration. I think in 2024, we're in a world today where we're communicating like we are right now across a country like this. This is not carrier pigeons, but that's kind of the way we have to do our administration when you're dealing with the first party payer as an extended health uh, benefits carrier with, uh, with work site benefits. So that said, the board government saying that they're looking to now remove that and the auto insurers pay first. That is just absolute like logic. And that is the way it should be. And here's the irony. The benefits by which the, the MIG that we're talking about is not to be affected, i.e. the monies that were allocated to the MIG are to be separated to the work site benefits anyway, or the work, the work benefits. So what we want to be careful with is as FISRA goes through, as the government instructs FISRA and the insurance company pushes back and says, well, if the auto insurer is going to be the first payer, that's going to cost the auto insurer more money. Wait a minute. I mean, given that you're trying to stay within the confines of the MIG, which is the smallest and lowest uh, allocation of, of funds to any first party payer in Canada, this was something that was supposed to be subrogated and separated from the extended health benefits anyway. It wasn't supposed to be a replacement. So that argument doesn't fly. And at the end of the day, as we've been talking about now, you're, you haven't reviewed our fee guides yet. I have to believe insurance rates since 2010 and 2014 have increased. So if I'm an insurer and I know, and we've got stats, the payouts on insurance uh, uh, accidents have been going down. And certainly during COVID, there, there were, I don't know if it's billions, but hundreds of millions of dollars due to lack of driving that the insurers certainly made by continuing premiums and throwing people back a bone of a $50 or a $100 credit, that doesn't fly. So I'm hoping that the Ford government, through their thumb on FISRA, looks through that to say, hey, you know what? You, this might be something that sways for a little more cost because we're going to raise the prices. But what's been going on from 2000, to Anthony's point, when they came on, I'd like to know how much has been banked away from 2018 to 2022, when you know three of those years there were minimal driving uh, pa driver patterns out there, accidents were down, premiums were not going down. So that's going to be an argument based on two things: these two recommendations: increasing the fees, re re uh, uh, reviewing the MIG, and of course the first party payer being the auto insurer. And we have to be able to have faith that FISRA through the government is going to see through that for the health service providers and most important, the patients. So again, uh, auto insurance companies are rapacious. At least that's the allegation. So well, let's just quickly talk about what it was in the 2024 budget. The government said, quote, it will be proposing to make auto insurance pay for medical and rehabilitation services following an accident before extended health care plans do, which oh, I know it's just I have a hard time understanding this. How could it have been this way for so long? It would apply to all automobile accidents, regardless of the injury sustained. And the changes would, again, quote, help reduce paperwork and red tape for patients and their healthcare providers. So, Anthony, let me ask you this. Is this a move that's shifting some of the, some of the say, the power and some of the prerogative being in the auto insurance company's corner and moving now to maybe health service, healthcare providers, and the patients? First of all, let me just say, this is a brilliant move done by the Ford government. So let, let's, if when I unpack the way the, the wording is, all types of injuries. So that means minor injuries, non-catastrophic injuries, and catastrophic injuries, all types of injuries following a car accident, the government is proposing means, and, that, and that's the wording it's saying because it is proposing, it will be proposing it in legislation, it's in the budget. And that is something that people are saying that the government is saying it will do. 
So it will do this in legislation. It will propose this in legislation. And what that means is people who have a job won't get punished for having a job. What that means is people will be able to keep their work benefits for their chronic injuries that they're already using at their local family chiropractic clinic and family physiotherapy clinic with their regular provider. And that's really, really important because it doesn't punish people for having a job. In addition to that, what it does for healthcare providers is it significantly reduces our red tape. In, in Ontario, about 70% of people have a benefits plan. And of those 70%, the couples, 50% of them have two benefit plans. What that means is if I see a person in November, by the time I finish and I collect all the paperwork, the first invoice I could send out most of the time is in June of the following year. That's how long it takes me to send one invoice for treatment. Oftentimes, that person, that first invoice only covers a sliver and I'm collecting statements from different from different disparate insurance companies just to finally get paid. The amount of work that that, that will save will allow us to focus on patients, patients care, save time, away from the from the desk late night hours and allow us to see people and be more focused on the people that are injured the detriment of red tape the detriment that this government uh, is getting rid of in this proposal is significant we spend so much time doing paperwork we want to put our patients first and 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 this government has seen that so yes this is an incredible win for us we're so relieved. It's 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 the light at the end of the tunnel that we've been waiting for. And believe me, healthcare providers have been saying this to the regulators for decades. And it's always fallen on deaf ears with previous government. This is the first government that's actually listened, looked, and said, you guys can't keep doing this. And we're grateful. Dr. Wilson, let me ask you, you mentioned earlier in our interview today that there, are, you know, you have professional colleges and associations that uh, serve to help regulate your industries. You don't really need FISRA. Let me ask you, what role have any of the associations and professional colleges that you work with have played a role in achieving some of these gains with the government? Well, I mean, in speaking with, um, you know, quite uh, closely with the Ontario Chiropractic Association. First of all, the colleges, they don't take a stance on these. They, it's the associations that would jump in. Um, I think it's important for people to understand what, what we have are colleges which protect the public. And that is who we're saying really are the ombudsman, if you will, for this whole industry. There's, there's no reason to have FISRA involved. They weren't involved or FISCO weren't involved pre-2014, I think 14, is when they brought in FISCO. Before that, they weren't there. And they were only brought in to bring in for uh, uh, a, a billing service to use a, as, a, as a portal for invoicing. So just to be clear, that's what we want the colleges. That's their role. They're already there. They're a regulator already for physiotherapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, protecting the public, including the insurance companies. They do protect the insurance companies. If the insurance companies have a problem, they can complain to the College of Chiropractors, Physiotherapists, Massage Therapists, or like, and so forth. Um, in terms of the associations, the Ontario Chiropractic Association, Physiotherapy Association, Registered Massage Therapy Association, the, these associations, they came together to create a coalition to have a voice. I think, you know, without sounding uh self-promoting to us on the call one of the reasons we put this together and to work and speak through reg watch was we wanted a voice that we felt that the associations were not able to deliver to their membership i mean there are the public can see this but really it's the other healthcare practitioners that will now listen to what I'm saying, what you've been saying, Brent, in 2023, what Anthony's been saying, and your other guests. This is the kind of, you know, uh, domain that allowed us to do that. I'm not saying that the associations were moot. They were not. They were, in my uh, speaking with the OCA, the CEO, Caroline, she was fantastic. She 
was definitely on the same page with the absolute same points. I mean, I will say what has been extremely um, beneficial is that no one colored outside of the line, meaning we wanted the first party payer of extended uh, like work site or work, uh, workplace, I keep saying work site, workplace benefits, extended health benefits away. That's what the associations wanted. We want to see the MIG revisited. We want to see the fee schedule from 2014 uh, revisit the OCA, the OPA. They want to see the same thing. In terms of the redundant regulator, I, I know that probably wasn't as high on their list, but it's there. They understand that, that they are lockstep with everything that we have been advocating and the win from the Ford government to you know, bring those two points to, you know, not just a proposal, but to put them into, into action, into, you know, to fruition, the associations were supporting behind that. I just think that we, we, we maybe needed people like us, people like yourselves to help get that message out there to them, to the professions, to distill this down to a couple of points that we won on and to continue on that. I do think though, it's important that given the associations are the voice and the advocates of the regulated health professionals they support, we pay to be part of the association. We expect the association to be our advocate, whether you're a physiotherapist, a massage therapist, or a chiropractor, or uh, the, the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association. While the colleges, they can play the role of FISRA, we'd like the associations to play the role of the advocate. And we need them to continue on that. But at, at least we know they were strong with us. And I would say, at least speaking from the OCA, I don't know the OPA as well. Um, they were lockstep with us, especially leading up into the budget. So it was a very positive, it was very positive. And, and I think, you know, it's funny, as Anthony said, it's been a bunch of governments that have gone through here. This is the first one that's done anything. It, it really, I mean, I'm not trying to, pat us all on the back again. But really, when we started this endeavor in June or May or June of last year, 2023, that's when I really started leaning in on the OCA. That's when the OCA started sending out uh, bulletins to their membership. That's when they started to do a whole bunch of surveys. And that's when they came in line and said, you know what, what you're saying and we're saying are the same, let's both go. So I think behind closed doors, they made a difference. So, gentlemen, we've talked quite a bit here already about the minor injury guideline. I just wanted to add that this guideline sets the cap on the dollar amount available to provide rehabilitative care, which is currently set at $3,500 in Ontario, which, as you can see in this table, is the lowest in the country. So let me ask you this, and this is a bit of the tough one. If health service providers, health care providers receive a fee increase, which is the first in a decade, will that not mean either a decrease in the amount of care patients would receive or at least eventually an increase in auto insurance rates? Let me, let me be clear. Health care professionals have been subsidizing large auto insurance companies for over a decade. The cost to treat a patient that we were as much as more than we're getting paid for. We deal with people one on one. We care for them. They come into our lives. We give something of each other and hopefully they leave for the better. The fees that we receive power the treatment. They are the energy at $200 for a month of care. There's only so many times we can afford to see a person and it breaks our hearts. Yes, the fees for treatment are long overdue to go up. And the minor injury guideline is also long overdue to go up. But what that will result in is more people getting better, more people going back to work, less people on social assistance because their injuries never improve, less people with chronic pains. And there's where you will find the savings because that means less people to 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 with long-term problem with long-term costs with long-term litigation that will result in a settlement with the insurance company because they're better 
They're back to their daily life. Nobody wants to stay home. They want to go back to work. They want to be productive. They want to have a purpose. When people come to me and they want to get better, they want to return to their purpose. This, 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 this last 14 years has been so difficult. Patients have been frustrated and health service, healthcare professionals have been frustrated because we're, we're fighting, we're fighting and we don't have enough energy in terms of the time that we can give our patients. And, and let's be fair, you know, healthcare providers have had a freeze on their fees for the minor injury guidelines for 14 years and health service providers for 10. Listen, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority regulates insurance companies. Let them put a cap on executive compensation at the insurance companies. Let them put a cap on salaries at the insurance companies. For the next 15 years, it'll all even out.